on this episode, living legend Ray Dalio stops by. Hey everybody, this is Gary Vay, Nerd Chuck, and this is episode 275 of the Ask Gary V Show, and I'm super fired up about this episode, and let me explain to you why. Knowing my audience, I have a feeling a lot of you are about to be exposed to an extremely interesting gentleman. More importantly, I think he's gonna have disproportionate impact on a sector of you, because I do think it's coming from an angle that I would argue has very similar seeds to I think what makes me successful, but comes from a completely different angle. And I think that's exactly how you tend to get uh, results. And so Ray Dalio, please, first and foremost, allow me to thank you for being on the show. Thank you for having me, I'm thrilled to be here. Number one, I'm impressed and I wanna make sure everybody checks this out. You are hustling, which excites me. You are showing up in all sectors, on all sorts of places I respect, Tim Ferriss's podcast, other places of that nature. And then, when I look at Bill Gates and Tony Robbins and Ariana Huffington and Jamie Dimon and Mehmet Oz and Reed Hastings, the Rolodex of quotes for your new book, which by the way, I just told Ray something very important. I do not read, as all of you know. The, when I make the joke that I've written more books than I've read, I'm getting dangerously close, but the few times I do read is when I'm on vacation between December 20th and the 24th when I go off the grid and I will be reading this book, so I'm excited. Now, so you guys know, that happens because my team's working with him and the, and the vibe that Lindsay and Hannah and the rest of the team, Molly, talk about this project continues to build on the fascination that I had when we first met. But the, the book's buzz, and more importantly, the reaction, because I like to watch people. I don't consume content, but I consume people's reactions. The reactions to the concept of the principles and the, and, and the book itself has been overwhelming. I feel like you had great ambition for this project when I met you. How has it been going? Before I get into your origin story, how do you feel about the launch of this incredibly important project? Well, I judge it by the thank yous I get, you know, and on, yes. on social media, I'm yes. just getting massive amounts all the time. And my, I mean, my goal was to uh, convey to people things that worked in my life. I was very lucky enough, and I, I don't know, I learned by a lot of mistakes, a lot of things that made me successful. And I wrote those down year by year, all these principles every time I would make a decision. So there was a big bunch of those and I shared them with a lot of people over a period of time, three and a half million people at one point on uh, uh, social media, downloaded them and got a lots of thanks. My goal was to help other people be successful and the reactions have been thanks and appreciation. So I feel like, I feel great about it. So what, what has been the biggest surprise to the reaction of the book from whether that is the masses saying X or somebody that you talked about this with privately over the last 10 years said Y or somebody stopped you in the street or this one quote that you never expected? Like as a net score, what has been the biggest surprise to you on the reaction of the book? The getting the concepts, okay. So let me just explain the concept. Please. Every time I made a decision, I would write down the criteria for making those decisions. So this is a bunch of principles that I've acquired over a period of time. Those people then started to learn the benefit of that. And then it caught on for me in my life because if I knew those principles and I could communicate with those principles, then I knew that I could communicate with you if I could have partnership with you. Any relationship that I had whether it's a family relationship or whether it's a business, and then I could build an idea meritocracy, in other words, where the best ideas would win out. Yes. So there was a process of building these principles, writing them down, making them clear, and then taking those things and we built them into algorithms so that we could have the computers make decisions. That whole notion of how to be operating differently with principles, not just with decisions, that I didn't know that I would be able to convey. And now people are starting to think in terms of principles. And I think it has a big effect. Like, what are our principles of our country? Do we, do we have common principles? Do we have different principles? So I was very surprised, or very pleasantly surprised, 
that people are understanding the linkages about how that systematic decision making you, principle decision making works. Were you worried that it took high intellect to synthesize it? And so when you say surprise, pleasantly surprised, you were worried that you wouldn't be able to articulate the simplicity and then thus the masses wouldn't be able to consume it. And, and that's been exciting for you. I, um, I, I guess I'd say I'd say it in the following way. Please. Uh, um, I think that people are so caught up in making decisions, right. but they haven't thought about principles. Okay, now, that's a different way of thinking. When you start to realize that everything happens over and over again, yes. and you have a principle, yes. I'm, I'm, let me be clear what I mean by yes. principles, right? It's how to deal with a certain thing that happens over and over yes. again effectively. You can have principles for skiing, you could have principles for parenting, right. you could have principles for investing, that's right. whatever that is. And the issue of being able to understand it's another one of those, yes. that you start to see yes. something, and you say, ah, it's that species of thing. Pattern recognition. And, and, yes, and connecting it to the underlying principles. Because then if you realize that there is a limited number of species of, of things that are gonna to happen to you, and they happen over and over again, you can kind of go to that species, you say, this is that species of thing, how do I deal with that thing? And by being able to have that principle that is very clear to you, and make the connection between that thing and your decision, and you do it over, and you refine it over a period of time, and you communicate it, it's a very, very powerful way of operating. And because I think we're in a different world now, we were in a world where um, it, principles that bound us together typically came from religion. In other words, a Judeo-Christian background. And we say, 100%. what are the principles that bind us together? 100%. As, when, as religions then fade in our past, yes. in our history, yes. um, with the, religion has become less important. Yes. Where do we learn principles? How do we get principles? So we're now in an environment, I would say, which is a low point in terms of principles. If you ask them, what principles do you have? And if you were to compare those, one man's with another, it's another. I understand. To, so how do we, so the notion of being able to move to principled thinking, to have people articulate it, and then to compare it, and then to evolve. I think that we're going to evolve so that we, as a group of people, could say, what are our principles? And then do, do we are we bound do, together by those principles? Do you, I apologize, do you believe things like the Ten Commandments or the Bill of Rights or principles? Sure. Do you believe that there is vulnerability in the interpretation of? I think that there is the absence of. In other it. words, when... Yep. When we could say the interpretation, yeah. I don't think most people are sitting there and going off the checklist of the Ten Commandments or the Bill of Rights and then saying that. I think they're lost, right? Yeah. And I think that religion is that element of religion. And I, by the way, I don't think that's a particular problem. I, 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 I think that each individual has now got to determine his own principles. I agree. And so that's the notion that I'm very excited about because when we, they come along and they're saying, now Gary writes down, what is Gary's principles? Principle and number that, one, Michael Jor Jordan is a bad person. Keep going. <laughs> okay. Okay, keep going. I'm a Knicks fan, 42 years old, just to give you some context, Ray. No, but I, I understand. Right, like my principle, uh, for uh, something I think as you're talking, I'm like, right, it's like my belief that why not treat life like a marathon, especially in the financial sector, everybody treats it like a sprint. If you're gonna be around, marathon characteristics are better. Right, well, Gary's got his way of succeeding. Yes. Okay, so if you're a successful person, yes. there were certain things that Correct. you did to make decisions. Yes. And if you go slowly and yes. you write that down that, and you say, now when I'm in this situation, I make that decision that way, and you collect those you principles and did. you get them. Principles are the formula for success. And by getting people to think about what are their formulas for success, get them from wherever you can. These happen to be mine. I was lucky in that I, you know, like yourself, I started out with nothing, right? And, and then I stumbled my way along. And then over a period of time, uh -huh. um, I became something more than nothing. And so I learned these things. And I'm at a stage in my life where I wanted to pass those along. As long as I can continue to get other people to think uh -huh. about what they're, what are their recipes for success, then we're, that's a, what it's How all about. How much does self-awareness and empathy play into this? 
in the ability to extract out of you your principles? Well, the, I, I think in each person's case, um, self-awareness is a big thing. There's two parts of our do brain. Do you feel you're extremely self-aware? I I'm try not, to be. I, I do certain one things. One man's opinion okay, on that so, himself. So, uh, yeah, let me phrase it the following way. Okay. What helps me get my awareness yes. is um, the connection of my emotions with my intellect. In other words, when we say aware, there's a subconscious part of our brain. I yes. say that there's two yous, I right? I totally agree. There's a conscious part of your brain that's the 100%. thinking you, and then there's the subconscious yep. that you don't know. Yep. And by being able to bring those two things to, and make the connection between them, so if you feel something and it's coming up and you start to articulate it, then you're connecting it with its intellect. If it triangulates, in other words, if yep. the underlying psychology yep. emotion is in sync with your intellect, then you move forward. What's helped me a lot personally is meditation, transcendental meditation. When did I'm, that start happening? I, in 1969. Okay, so, okay, a long time ago. Yeah, January, uh, by the way, real quick, fun fact, January 12th, 1969 is the greatest day in American history. Do you know okay, why, right? no. It was the day the New York Jets won the Super Bowl. <laughs> Just a little fun fact for everybody watching at home. So 1969. 1969. Uh, Beatles were <laughs> I know where you're going. They came back. I have a funny I'm, feeling of how you stumbled into uh, meditation. I, anyway, yeah. I stumbled into meditation. <laughs> And probably with that funny feeling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's really interesting. And, and you started and, and continued your whole career? I've like always meditated, life? and it's changed my life. Can you tell me how often? What is the pattern within well, it? Well, typically twice a day, 20 minutes each time. And I, let me Inside, describe it. Yeah, I want, to, I want to hear you describe yeah. it. Yeah, and I want to go slow because I want to make it clear. That what happens is by, it's a very simple exercise that re, you repeat your mantra over and over again. That's a word that doesn't mean anything. And what it does is it takes you into your subconscious mind. You're not conscious. You're not unconscious. You're in your subconscious mind. It's a peacefulness. And in your subconscious mind, that's the part we're talking about is the second you, okay? It, the, it makes a connection between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. And so it, um, it, that's where your creativity comes from. In other words, if you want to take a... If you want creativity, it's not like you muscle it in your conscious mind. It's like take a hot shower and the ideas come to you and you grab the ideas. They come up from your subconscious mind. And that connection also creates your creativity. So because creativity comes from there. So it gives you an equanimity. In other words, it's like a ninja. You can sit back, things come at you, and everything seems sl slower, more in control and you're in constant in control. So that I equanimity. I, I, I apologize, but yeah. I have to, I'm just impatient. Go ahead. Can somebody be in that state constantly? No. Okay. You go into it and you come out of it, but you can feel the difference. In other words, I walk around knowing that um, when I feel one way and it's different from the other and, and I can then say, okay, I want to go into the other because that gives me the equanimity and that equanimity and that creativity is power. Can you go into it without the mantra 20 minute play? I can almost slip into a kind of, ah, uh, it feels that way so I can carry something with me, but I'm not going into the same depth as that meditation. I see, because, so, because that part resonates with me tremendously. Um, so it's interesting to see. So I think I can slip into that kind of zone quite a bit, and I actually try to stay in that zone at all times. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think through pattern recognition and this conversation, it's how the things slow down. But it's interesting to hear you say deeper. Uh -huh. Have you tried meditating? Not much, no. Uh, okay, we'll talk about this at, at some point. I'm sure. I would urge you, Yes. okay? Because you're a little bit like me. I think you're a little hyper, right? Yes. Okay, I'm hyper. Yes. I've got a, I don't know whether it's ADD or whatever it is, it. but anyway, I'm, I'm, the ideas are all I going it, through. Yeah. All of a sudden, then, when you can then go into this world yes. and so on, it's unbelievable because it gives you that control over your mind. I'm like, I'll tell you, you for it's every human it's being. Interesting. I apologize go ahead. because I want to share this. Yeah. But I feel massively controlled in the chaos and speed. Okay. I'll tell I, get, you, it, I get more here, unco uncomfortable in the piece. Let me yeah. give you an example. I want music glaring at all times. Like, I'm uncomfortable in quiet. Uh -huh. That's your problem. Okay, I, I believe you. I believe you. That's your problem. Um, because you're not letting that, you're not going into that subconscious mind. You're highly conscious. 
you know, when you sit down you're in, there, you're going to be in a position where you're going to get restless because I know it happened to me. I love stuff. I love stimulation yes. and so on. But when you go into this other experience that you don't know what it's like yet, you're going to find that all of a sudden you're going to um, get antsy and that's signs that you're not in control. I understand. You're in a world of nothing. Uh, you're in a world of a lot of stuff. I understand. When you go into the void. Yes. Ooh. It's something else, okay? And that means you'll gain control. I understand. You don't have control of your mind. I understand. One doesn't have control of one's mind if one can't do that, right? I understand. I understand that. It's neat. It's neat. Yeah. Do you so, think it was January 12th, 1969 when you started this? Because <laughs> I think it might be. <laughs> Maybe. Right, right. Uh, I apologize. I really want this because I think people are completely fascinated, but I want to set this stage Bef- instead of going all the way back to the origin, your professional life that, that like at a high level I was aware of when we first met and others that are watching right now, but for the ones that don't, wh- what is your professional career from the beginning? From literally the beginning. First day you actually worked, what did you do? Well, when I, uh, when I was 12, I caddied. Uh, so my, my, I'm an investor, yes. right? I'm, yes. uh, I'm running the a largest A very successful hedge. investor. Right. Uh, yes. Um, for those who don't know, uh, yeah. I run Bridgewater Associates, which is the largest hedge fund in the world. Yes. Um, when did that start? Nine, uh, I started in uh, 1975, but I started trading markets when I was 12. Interesting. So, and I... Real quick, I, did, I apologize. You started it in 1975? Yeah. November 14th, 1975? I don't know. Did the Jets win then, too? No, I was born on that day. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I was, you know, just trying to nail <laughs> well, some another good day. Here. Another, yeah, good another day. great another all-time good day. historic day. Great. Um, and so, okay, in 75, but you started trading at 12. Why? I, I caddied at a, I at a caddied. fancy place? Um, it was a fancy place and to me. To, I didn't, you're right, of course. Okay, and they so were talking? I'll tell you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was I, I walked talk. It was the '60s. Yep. This was when the stock market was hot, and we would talk about stocks. And I would earn six dollars a bag. I carried two bags, twelve dollars. Whenever I would get like fifty dollars or more, then I would buy stocks. And the first stock I bought was the only stock that I ever heard of. Here's my criteria: the only stock I ever heard of that's selling for less than five dollars a share. And the reason I bought it was I figured I could buy more shares, so it went it. up and I would make more money. I get it. I what an yeah, investment I know, I strategy, know, know, right? St- you were 12. 12, it's right? It's an early strategy. It's okay. Okay. You, you yeah. built on top of that okay. strategy. Okay, so what happened is, well, what happened what is- What was it? What happened was the, the company was about to go bankrupt. Somebody took it along, uh, acquired it. It tripled, and so I was hooked, uh, right? So I was awesome. hooked. I said, this is easy. Do you remember the name of the company? Yeah, Northeast Airlines. Northeast no, yeah. Airlines, okay, and, uh, cool. and and so I figured this is going to be an easy game because like you can go into the Wall <laughs> Street Journal, and, and you have all these names. Like I just need to pick one that goes up or one that goes down. Well, and then I was just thinking up, okay. So that's when I got hooked, and then I learned over a period of time that investing is not easy. Okay, it's an extremely difficult thing, and you have to be an independent thinker. The thing that I learned the most, which was the most, um, was first. Um, whether you're um, a, an investor or you're an entrepreneur, that you have to think differently in order to be successful. So you have to bet against the consensus. That's right. Betting against the consensus and being right is what you need to do, and that's not easy, okay? And I'll tell you, when you go down that path, you're gonna be wrong a fair amount of time. That's exactly right. And so in order to know how to be wrong, so what I learned from this, the main thing I learned, was um, to be an independent thinker and also to also have humility, okay? Because the humility, the, the worry about being wrong is the thing that is a power. It gave me an open-mindedness. That open-mindedness to worry about being wrong, to, to, to find the most intelligent people who disagree with me to, so I could gain their perspective. So not curiosity. You appreciate that. Tra- so this is what was the most powerful influence. And so I remember I crashed in 1982 in the markets. I mean, meaning, if you want the story, I'll tell you the story. Okay. Um, So I started the firm in 1975. Yes. Okay. 1980-81, I calculated that the um, foreign countries had lent, been lent by American banks more money than those banks, those countries could pay back to those banks. Understood. And it was two and a half times their entire capital. And I calculated that they were going to default. 
That was a crazy point of view at that time. Very controversial, independent point of view. Time, what was the counterpoint? Well, nobody thought you were going to have this giant default and collapse. Everybody thought, okay, banks are lending that. It just wasn't an awareness. Right. I it was like going have, into 2000, 2007, 2000, totally 2008. Okay, people didn't get it. Yeah. Okay. So, but you're, I have to be an independent person. I did the calculations. I went around. Lo and behold, on August 1982, Mexico defaults on its debt. Um, and this was a controversy. I get a lot of attention. I'm asked From the to testify. I'm asked. Barons, well, I, I was asked to testify to Congress oh, and to explain explain to them what what's what, going how on. How did you figure it out? And I was asked on Wall Street Week, which was then the show yes. of the time, yep. and so on. And so, very pu very publicly, um, I had said we are going to go into an economic collapse. I couldn't have been more wrong. This was the exact bottom in the economy in the stock market. I was wrong. That didn't pass through. Okay, painfully wrong. Can you imagine? I had to let go everybody in my company at that point. I was down to basically me and having to make a decision of what I would do. This is now seven years after I started my company, right? And that was the best thing that ever happened to me in my life. I mean, what, well, maybe my, my, maybe my wife and kids would, but, but this was, in any case, what it gave me was the humility that I needed to balance with my audacity. It gave me that fear of being wrong, okay? That fear of being wrong. And that fear of being wrong gave me an open-mindedness. That was the bottom. That was then, from, from that point forward, from 1982 to now, now we have... 1,500 people at work there. It's been a tremendously successful operation, largely because of that gift of humility. And my attitude about mistakes changed a lot. In other words, mistakes, I began to think of um, as puzzles, um, that if I could solve the puzzle, I would get a gem. The puzzle is, what would I do differently in the future so I don't have that terrible experience again? And the gem would be principle, a principle of what I would do different in the future. And that's when I started to write them down. So every time I would make a mistake or have that pain, I would then write down those principles. So I What about the reverse? Uh, successes are nowhere near as valuable as, as, principle, as, as mistakes because you're doing something right. And it doesn't give you the, it, it doesn't give you the kick, Ray, Ray, do you know the motivation. I, do you know what I tell my audience? I tell them that I secretly dream to lose everything. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of people in this room, everybody's smiling right now. I literally use audacity and humility. I'm listening to you and I'm like, wow, we are stunningly similar. And Keep, this, go ahead. this is the thing that a lot of people don't understand and this is why it's so important. They think successful people are like successful people aren't. They think successful people are these all-stars, they're all-knowing people and so on. I got to know the most successful people in the world in all this. They're not like that, okay? They all have flaws, they just know how to compensate for it. And the compensation is largely knowing what they know and most importantly, knowing what they don't know. And so when I'm hearing you, I think you probably learned the same thing I learned. When we talk together, we convey, and this is true with most successful people, what you learned is you can't lose by an experience. When you have a secret desire that you're talking about that you might fail, okay, it's because you're making different connections and you and I making the same connection. I go into an experience and I say, I can't fail because either one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to have success or I'm going to have an experience that's going to teach me something. Right. And so I'm going to learn. And it's all, you learn more from the mistakes and the pains. I've got a saying, pain plus reflection equals progress. Pain plus reflection. So if you start to get that uh, instinctual reaction yep. that you have pain and you get past that moment because it's an emotional experience and you can't think all that clearly, you pause and you get past that moment and then you reflect in a quality way and you write down your principles of what you learned so that you would do it differently in the future, your life is going to be great because you're going to evolve. Failure is part of the process to achieve success. How? And when Wait, you reprogram like, yourself yes. to think that way, yes. all of a sudden you're on that path. 
And it's the opposite that you're taught. It's the opposite that you're taught in school. It's the opposite that you believe. Yes, you do. Successful people get it. How much of this equation has to factor in your ability to contextualize feedback from the people that you care about the most? Oh, it's essential, right? I'm aware. I'm right, trying to I mean, set you up here. Well, uh, in other words, it's, the criticism. It's the right? game. It's the key here. Do you love when people criticize? I love it. Of course you do. Of course I love it. I love it so much. Well, I love it. So, I pro- I, do you know I think I manipulate it? Uh-uh. Okay. I think a little bit of my shtick is to force negative feedback because I feed off of it so much. Well, it does two things. It allows you, first of all, to get the... Um, the the things that you might be missing because nobody sees themselves objectively. Of course, that's not that's possible. That's okay, not possible. it's impossible. Yeah. So not only do you get the objective feedback, but you redefine your relationship with the person because 100%. if you're if that person is carrying it around and they think oh you're screwed up this thing and they're having to bottle it up. Yes. You're going to have a lousy relationship with them. The ability to speak frankly with each other is the most important thing. We built an idea meritocracy. Okay, I was talking about some of my personal uh, uh, preferences and principles. But uh, uh, okay, now built an organization that is an idea meritocracy. Yes. Okay, meaning how the w- the best Guys, ideas so went out. Guys, everybody knows, I, I just want to help my audience a little bit here. What, what Ray's company was unbelievably famous for, this is how I interpreted it from afar, very far away, because I didn't pay attention to the finance world, but it hit the cultural lexicon, was the thought of like, oh my God, there's this company, Hedge Fund, which is very, you know, Wall Street, where, you know, uh, a, the first year in person from a very different background had an equal voice to the CEO, and they would debate it in a room. It was a radical campaign that hadn't been seen before. And I want to convey to everybody the magic of how this works, right? I just, this is this is one of the things I wanted to convey Please. in this book. Yes. And and and, and uh, okay, so now imagine that you're in an organization in which you really do believe it's an idea meritocracy yes. where the best yes. ideas win out, yes. okay? So um, then uh, I'm going to give you the sentence of one sentence about what my company Bridgewater was what I needed. Please. And what I recommend to everybody, an idea meritocracy in which the goals are meaningful work and meaningful relationships, that they're equally important because they I find them equally rewarding 100%. and they reinforce each other. So idea meritocracy, where the best ideas win out, in which the goals are meaningful work and meaningful relationships, which are achieved through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. Radical truthfulness means that anybody can say what they really mean. Yes. Okay? And the transparency means that you can't manipulate the truth. That's right. In other words, if you have transparency here, we we literally record everything for everybody to see. If I'm literally doing a review of somebody or if I'm uh, doing anything, including mostly making my mistakes, I get it. I show everybody that process. They show each other and you have that openness because you have bad things go on in the dark. When you open that, then everybody understands it, and so you get to truth. Do you have a sense of a reaction to the the situation in our society right now where the exposing of the shadows of our society are on full display right now? I, I think it's great. Me I too. think I, I think the, the key to an idea meritocracy is, is three steps. First, put your radical... Put your honest thoughts on the table for everybody to see. Most people don't do that, but but, nope. p- but put your honest thoughts on there. Everybody puts them on the table. Okay, now it's a lot clearer. We yep. honestly think that. Step that's step one. Step two is understand the art of thoughtful disagreement. Yes. In other words, you react to disagreement in a way where. It's it curiosity, continue, yeah. I might be wrong, That's how right. do we get not, there? It's a contentious not battle. as a fight, right? right. Not a an, political an, warfare. Not a, right, That's right. Not, right? Yeah. In other words, I'm curious. Yeah. Human nature and our habit is so counter to that. Yes. Two people go to a restaurant, one yes. says, I don't like the food, somebody's reluctant to say, oh, I do. Yeah. I mean, simple things like that. So to understand the art of thoughtful disagreement, that's step number two. And through that, you can understand each other better, you can probably make a better decision than you can make individually. The power of good collective decision-making is enormous relative to what anyone has in their own head. 
And then the third step is if you don't have uh, uh, an agreement yes. with that, how do you get past that? Right. You have to have a protocol right. yeah, in, in any a relationship. Uh, in some, a however court. you do yeah. it. You might, if there needs to true, be a judge and jury, whether uh, it's a process or, or a human or what have or, right. I don't know. It's the same. It can't go on if, forever. Right. It may be the same with your spouse. Maybe. It, I mean, in other words, you still have whoever Is you're with. Is flipping a coin a good idea? It could be. Maybe. It may be the rule. In other words, or what I like to do, what I general go to, is mutually agree on a party. And that um, that you say, okay, help me through this disagreement and help me get to that. That's a, a, a good handy process. Or we, in our own way, we have what we call believability weighted decision making. I'd like to tell you about it, okay? Believability weighted decision making. To describe what it's like, I'll use a simple example. Go ahead. You're sick. Yes. You have a bad disease and yes. you want to go and you say, I better go to the doctor. Well, you know that you're not the person to prescribe yourself. So you know that... Um, you're not the believable person. So the best thing you could do is to find three people, two or three people, ideally doctors in that case, who will disagree with each other, who are willing to fight, find the right answer and will disagree. If you do that kind of triangulation and you, they all sort of agree and, and then you're listening and it makes sense what they're saying, probably you should go down that path. When they're disagreeing, they're bringing to the surface the issues. When you start to think about how do I make sense of that and how do I weigh that, you're then going to come forward and you're going to weigh. At the end of the decision, you're going to say, who am I going to believe? And what you're going to do in your, in your subconscious mind is going to go, oh, I weigh this one more than that one and I'm going to make a decision. Okay, so now imagine a system in which everybody has believability weighted points. In other words, imagine that all the people that you're working with yes. actually start to create points. I yes. won't digress yet and in, no, how we do it. But let, so that now we know that your believability on that subject is different than your believability and everybody has that. Then you have a weighted average vote based on believability. OK, that's an idea of meritocracy. It's going to get you the best decision. The reason it gets you the best decision is because you as an individual don't have the best answer. In other words, if I come to there, I'm, if I'm always the one that, that's the boss, Think about decision making. There's two Be types before of. Before you go there, Ray, yeah. I'm just ridiculously curious now, and I'm doing a good job staying quiet, and the fans are very happy right now while they're commenting about my quietness and the fact that we're so similar, which is probably interesting to them. I'm dying to know this answer. So you did this, you scaled it, it's unparalleled documentation. You know, I can be empathetic to it. I document not only my business, my, my actual life. Da, 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 da. On the hedge fund level, it book. has nothing to do with being a hedge fund. I'm very aware. On the hedge fund level. Okay. When did the process of things like this or the principles make the wrong call on the execution on the business level? Um, I, we, we make mistakes all the time. Of course, of course. Uh, that I'm uh, asking but, but, you for, what, no, no, but I'm does, asking you for the pattern recognition. So I'm listening. Okay. You're deploying. What, 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 it do, what it does is it shifts the probability of making mistakes. I understand dramatically less. I understand. Less. Okay, but I'm not... Ha not then let, let me c continue. Clarify. Did you find any pattern recognition to the vulnerability of the principles in the execution of the principles in the hedge fund environment? What we... And it wasn't... It's not the particular hedge fund environment. It is the notion of being... Of individuals being able to separate themselves from their opinions. To be able to know what their bad at what their weaknesses are and to by having that person by person so that they can then put together the teams in other words people think differently somebody's very creative they're not reliable understood somebody's very reliable they're not creative that's right they can't get there them, themselves without having it all so to know and embrace their strengths and their weaknesses and to be do you able think to somebody should triple down on their strengths if you're self-aware and you I know think, you're creative, I th I, 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 I or think, do you spend time on the vulnerability? No, no, I th I, I th the vulnerability. You've got to cover. Okay, That's what we're you different. naturally. Go ahead. Okay, I'm because curious. Because your natural, you, your your strength is going to lead to your success, and you've got it. Okay, where I watch everybody fail is in their vulnerability. If you go back, go back and examine the are there, problems. Are there things that are commodity vulnerabilities versus like like to me a vulnerability nobody, lack of self awareness nobody, is, a, is a fatal vulnerability. Sorry? Lack of self-awareness is a fatal vulnerability versus being good at structuring sentences. 
Yeah, lack of self-awareness, particularly what I'm saying is lack of self-awareness where it produces what you don't know your weakness is, is killing you. Okay, to be able to orchestrate. Well, look, you run a business. I run a business, 1500 people. Okay, that's and you take that and you say what you do is you orchestrate the power of other people. And and it's like an orchestra. I totally understand. Some guy is playing violin and another guy is playing the oboe. And those people actually have different skills. Putting players in a position to succeed. Right. 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 And in order to do that, you have to really know what they're like. And you know what the biggest problem of most people and the biggest problem of most companies? They don't want to really get at what people are really like. Include they don't want to look at their weaknesses. Of course. That's the biggest source of failure. And it's therefore, if you know that, it's the biggest path to success. A hundred thousand percent. Do you believe that people are incentivized in the short term, which makes them close the eyes because they think they can get through the funnel? All before? the time, right? It's it's, it's like the, the same f- shit. It's like the first order consequences and the second order consequences. More often in life, life tricks you because the first order consequences are the opposite that's of the correct. second order consequences. Meaning, if you look at it's like food. All the food that's delicious is probably bad for you, and all I mean a lot of them. It's and the and the food. True, man. Uh, so and and it's the exercise. Okay, and it ain't fun. I don't like it the first order consequences are the opposite of the second order consequence. Right. a lot of life it's almost like you're being tricked and life is going to trick you i believe that you're going to go the guy who goes after the first order consequences without regard to the second order consequences is going to be in i trouble. call it checkers and chess okay people are always just doing the first that's right and so that is the key oh, that's 100%. why that's that's why you have developed that instinct that we just talked about a little bit go where you can succeed from failure how do a lot of people don't get this most people don't get this because they think failure i don't want failure but because you learned and i learned how to make the most out of failure my instinct is almost failure equals success Me now too. that sounds dumb I, no it doesn't okay. i call failure it failure equals success mi- micro fail true. micro failures macro wins right because you learn 100%. whatever you do. As long if as it doesn't not, eliminate you. That's exactly. The, that's it. Exactly. If you don't get killed, knocked out of the game. Okay. Keep playing. Okay. You know how many fighters get knocked down in the first round and win the fight? A high percentage. It's just, it's just so interesting. Right. I love this shit so much. Right. I believe in this. I believe in this tremendously. And, and where it takes me, and it took you in a certain path, where it takes me is the inner relationships. I think a lot of people can't execute what you and I believe in deeply because of their inability to contextualize feedback of their inner circle. What, but I, I found, that I built a whole culture based on this and I built and I found this. It takes about 18 months to get in the habit. It's all a matter of habit. I, I understand. And, and if you create a culture I understand. In which it becomes part of the culture. It's like a culture in which people, I I don't know, are eating and doing healthy things. Then it becomes self-reinforcing. And it can be done. What I did in the book was to put together all the protocols. Because I wanted a book, not just theory like this. I wanted to get to produce personal change. In other words, and and if you're doing the personal change thing, you got to do certain things that are protocols that I try that I learned over those by making the mistakes over something like you know whatever it was 40 some odd years that's what did I wanted to pass along. Did your parents instill self esteem into you or did you think that you developed it over time by how, what you surrounded yourself with? Um I don't my my mother loved me a lot. I think my dad loved me a lot. Um I, but I'm I, I don't know where uh, my dad was a jazz musician. And I, so I didn't, he stayed up late at night and he would come back and I didn't see a whole lot of them. Same I don't know um, exactly what that meant to me. That's all yep. deeply subliminal yep. or whatever. Yep. Um, but I did think my mom thought I was terrific and she loved me a lot. That was a blessing. I was also blessed to be in, able to have the most fundamental things of being able to, you know, have a stable house. I, I could go to a school that was a good it. school, those things. It. A lot of people are not in that position. Are you competitive? But, no, I'm not competitive as much as driven. I understand. Okay. Did you I ever mean, cry when you lost the game? Hmm. I I don't know. Okay. You know, I don't think so. Right. I don't I don't think so. Okay. But I don't really know. You know, because it's such a long time ago. Right. It wasn't like eight years ago in Monopoly. Yeah. 
I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, listen, I'll be honest with you. This is super, f- I, I wish you knew more about me. They are literally, there's an enormous amount of people watching right now that are freaking out because not only are we similar in our framework, we're using similar, I mean, I use audacity and humility. I will show you content. One of the great things about documenting everything is I'm not pandering to this conversation. I will show you videos from five, six, seven years ago. I believe in audacity and, and humility and self-awareness. This is the only thing I believe in. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't even know what else to tell you. Like this is uh, the framework, I call it a blueprint, uh, you call it a principle, it's the punchline. It's short term, long term, it's the value of patience, it's micro failures, macro wins, it's just all the same shit. I might not even read the book I, anymore. I understand, this is, this is, this is what you're talking about. This, this, is, this is how much you know and how, how good you are at something. This is humility. I get it. If you wanna be successful, be here. I got it, man. Right? Now you understand it, a lot of people understand it. It's not what our education system teaches. No shit. Our I got education D's and F's, system Ray. is the opposite. Right, I got D's and F's. I understand. I was a lousy student. No, I, no, no, no. No, D's really? and F. No, were you D's and F's? I was, you got C's. I got C's. Respect. I, okay, so I was okay. <laughs> but uh, okay. But but D, I mean like I get it. Okay. Do and, you believe so let's talk about that. Because yeah. I think people will find that fa- fascinating. You yeah. have an all-time career. I'm pretty damn convinced as long as I stay healthy, I'm gonna have an all-time career. We get season D. Do you think that we had so much natural self-awareness and self-esteem being built by our moms that it gave us the audacity at such a young a- age to quantify what the hell we were in and starting to develop other things that were naturally gonna happen later? I don't know. I could only tell you what it was for me, right? Okay. I, I mean, for me, it was like all that other stuff was like memorize this, remember this, follow instructions. Right. My brain didn't work that me way, neither. right? I have a terrible rote memory. Like if I'm if if I have to remember anything, like that, it doesn't have a reason for being what it is. Yes. All numbers, names, yes. and all. Yes. That. So there was something in any case, but I had a lot of curiosity. A lack of, a lack of practicality. Uh, no, I wasn't practical. No, no, no. Did that seem like to me? Remember, no. oh, oh. they're still doing it, Ray. When the information's on the goddamn phone, right in front of you. I understand. I mean, and that means you, you, you destroy. I mean, to me, it destroys your thinking, oh, it, your curiosity. Uh-huh. Anyway, I, I, I don't do you, know. Do you think I don't lack, know why do you think I was lack, that way? Do you way? think lack of education can be a disproportional strength? Oh yeah, because you have to discover. Because you have to I discover for yourself. For Discovering for yourself. There's a negative correlation. Uh, you have to discover for yourself. Do you follow instructions or do you discover for yourself? Do you remember? How can Ray. you be an independent Ray. thinker? Ray. Like uh, we just w- went through this, this issue in the investment area. Yes. Or if we're taking an entrepreneur. Yes. I just told you, you got to be an independent thinker. Right. Okay. How do you get to be an independent thinker? Got to taste It's certainly for yourself. not by following instructions and memorizing Why do you what think I don't read any fucking books? You, and all the way until you're coming out of school. I get it. Ray, it's why I don't read books. It's why, before we went on air, everybody, I was Mm -hmm. telling Ray about what I'm up to here because we didn't talk about it last time. I had to taste this for myself. I could have hired people that ran CPG Mm -hmm. brands. Mm -hmm. I need to discover it for myself, contextualize it for myself, and understand the attention graph of the end consumer for myself. Right, so let me, and I'm the same way. That just has what I learned. But that's how our brains work that way. Let me say that other people's brains also work differently. Not as good. No, I'm you're kidding. Wrong. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're I'm kidding. Wrong. I know. I know. This I know. The, I know. This is the thing. What do you think? Why do you think I surround is, myself with people? Exactly. But it was a good. But it was a good joke, Ray. Uh, okay. All right. Good, keep going. Good joke. <laughs> That's the thing. I when agree. you realize you need it all, I agree. Okay, and you need Offensive that range. Offensive linemen get paid too. I agree, man. A left tackle is really expensive. Right. I'm with you, brother. Let's take a phone call. I'm I'm so curious to what Vayner Nation put your phone numbers into Facebook, as you know. I we have to take a call. This is a very intriguing conversation, mainly because two or three years ago, an enormous amount of people that knew me best told me that I should be a hedge fund manager, not because of the economics, but because of the way my brain worked. And it's just it's been interestingly running, sitting here knowing how the most successful you are in that world, I'm like, oh shit, they might have been right. Anyway, who's calling first? Tim. Tim. Ray, how much longer, well, just a little, let's take it way down while we get Tim on the phone. How much longer are you gonna be promoting? I'm just curious on a micro. Um, basically just through January or so, and then and then what I wanna do is pull other people's principles out and 
go that route and, and make it right. clear on that. Tim. And then, um, but basically, Understood. They, Tim? It, go, it goes down. Uh, yes, sir. This is Gary Vaynerchuk, and you're on with Ray Dalio. Gentlemen, this is Tim Ferriss calling. No, it Big is not. Fan. Get the yes, hell. It is. Is, <laughs> you guys are real characters. No. Hello, Timothy. <laughs> Good evening. Gennady Weiner. <laughs> to you. And my question is for Ray. Ray, I'm so excited by what you're sharing with the world, and it's of such great value. I, I have to ask you because our conversations have been so impactful for me. Could you give any advice to people who are watching and listening to this who have struggled with or struggle with depression or bipolar disorder, uh, challenges of that type? Um, yeah, as you know, I'm, I'm an expert on it. I have a son who's bipolar and uh, he's gone through the whole thing. And uh, so, I, I mean, I can give, you know, a lot. Um, and by the way, he's totally successful. He's totally together and he went through the journey. He did a, Paul's, Paul Daly is his name. He did a book, a movie called Touched with Fire. I recommend you see Touched with Fire. Anyway, it conveys it. Um, and so I'm an expert. I mean, we d did this. I'm listening. Um, uh, okay. So if you're first realize that um, insanity is at the brink of genius. In other words, that there's quite a lot. It's just almost a tuning thing. The thinking differently, that creativity. So, okay, it's a tuning thing. And then, what? okay, so the advice is, um, when you go through the bipolar, first, to recognize that you have to go along with the program, to follow other people. You have to uh, take your medicine. The, the, the things that the rules were, take the medicine, get to bed at um, before 11 o'clock every night because there's a biorhythm thing that's going on. Um, make sure, it, in his case, um, meditation helped him a lot. It helped him keep centered. And um, most importantly, don't do substance abuse in any kind of way, okay? Keep ultra clean. And so those were the things. And but Would because, that be difficult with the medicine part, step one, because you could go too far with it? No, the medicine, the medicine is a tuning thing. Understood. You start in. You're talking and about it, other things. So what they do is they, blend, they they knock you with the medicine to try to get you centered and control. Yep. It produces a numbness. Mm -hmm. That numbness is, has the effect of, um, you don't want the numbness. You mm -hmm. say, I want my life. Mm -hmm. Also, when you have to understand what a kick it is to have manias, like there's, it's a super high. And, you, and so you're denied that kind of super high. And so that's a very difficult thing to get past. But when you start to crash enough, as we talk about failure and crashing, mm -hmm. this is super crashing. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, I don't want it anymore. So you, and you have to realize that to tune that medicine is gonna take a while. It's a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it tunes it. And then, um, so uh, to be able to do that, to be able to realize that you will be more creative than ever, he's become incredibly creative because he can deliver on that other stuff. So when you start to realize that other people can do it. Right. Um, so uh, That's the punch Tim yes. and I talk about this because it, you know it's an issue. Yes. Uh, so uh, Tim, talk to me. No, I just wanted to elicit that because I'm sure there are people listening who can benefit from those recommendations. I've found that the going to bed by 11 or certainly before midnight even though I've historically been a night owl, is a, is a really effective intervention or preventative measure, like you mentioned. And the meditation, whether it's transcendental meditation or using an app like Headspace, is also a fantastic way to tune, like you said, the awareness of your emotional state so that you don't get carried away by the story that you tell yourself uh, or the stories that you might tell yourself. So I, I agree with you. I just wanted to hear someone of your credibility uh, expand on it a bit for people who are listening who might think that they're uniquely flawed in some way that's that's unfixable, that they're broken, because I just don't believe that to be the case, even though I've struggled with a lot of this myself. There's no broken. I just wanted to uh, yep. have you say it. A, a, a very important way, a very important thing is that you're probably gifted. A hundred thousand percent. In other words, read the book, uh, Touched with Fire, uh, by Kay Jamison and all okay. that. If you take the, the people, um, this is um, people who are the most creative people in the world. Yep. Um, I mean, you could have yep. Winston Churchill yep. and 
I mean, I could list all of it's these unbelievably creative people yep. who are bipolar, yep. okay? So there's a big gift element, yep. but it has to be managed. Yes. You have to get it tuned right. You know this, Tim, because you you know, you know experience it, I, we experience it. And so to realize that also, that means that people who are not suffering from these challenges also have the ability to move beyond it. They should have tolerance of other people. They should have understanding so they should be successful. Tim, Thank you for bringing that Tim, up. Tim, first of all, thanks for calling. It makes this super rad and fun. Second of all, uh, earlier I told Ray I was impressed with his hustle. He's showing up in many, many places. Uh, I also want to give you that accolade. First of all, thanks for coming the other day. Second of all, you're hustling. Like I, I, I can't avoid you. The book seems to be going well. How's it going? <laughs> yeah. It's go. It's going great. I appreciate it. Well, and let me I'm just to, let me just say yeah. something about the book, which is Please. really cool, um, because we're by coincidence we're all talking about principles. So I wrote this book, yes. which is you know how to think about yes. principles in general, and yes. then my yes. principles. Yes. And he immediately comes. And, I know. Same thing by I know. coincidence. You got a book of a whole bunch of people's principles, essentially. That is, so it's fantastic. Ray, do you want to destroy Tim's book sales? Do you want this to dominate Tim? I, How no, do you feel about no, that? No, no, like, Tim, man, we are in this thing together. Together. Get bundle people. packs. Yeah, okay, bundle oh, Wait a minute, packs. I'm going to join in, too. Crushing right. it, coming yeah. out January 30th on Amazon. Yeah. Principles. Yeah. I mean, like, we could go a three-way pack. But, uh, Kip, did you see the girth of Tim's book? Yeah, but it's, it's a reference book. I know. It's okay. I saw Don't, it. You, it's not like you sit there... It's oh, I know what, you can like consume it. Of course, the, right. the format was brilliant. Right, and the curiosity and that how, you might have. How about oh, Ray, I wonder what that was. But how about how good looking Tim is? We haven't talked about that part yet. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, so Tim, what's your principle? I know what it is, uh, stoicism. It is, that's a, that's a primary bedrock. And I yeah. think that also helps with the management of what we were talking yeah. about. And, uh, and not making this up, the most frequently bought together with my book is Principles by Ray Dalio. I love that. <laughs> hey, Tim. Uh, one of my favorite moves of all time in, in the thing that I'm fascinated about, which is attention, was during the height of TRL, P. Diddy would leave his office and go, and I think he was Puff Daddy back then, and he would go to TRL while Carson was on the air, and, and Ray, this was a show, do you know what TRL was? Yeah. Okay, so, in, you know, Carson Daly would be on, he would have the Britney Spears and the One Directions and the thing, oh not One Direction, excuse me, like 90 Degrees of the World and it's funny how that slipped up and that's funny. Anyway, nonetheless, he would have all these act-ons and Puff Daddy would leave his office at Bad Boy, drive to, town, to, to Times Square, run up this elevator, the stairs, get on set and run on, basically run on set, hack the attention of the youth of America and to get the exposure. Tim calling this show, right now is the P. Diddy move of 2017 <laughs> in publishing personalities. Tim, I'm impressed. I'm, I'm very impressed by your strategies and I love you very much. <laughs> well, I love you guys too. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. See ya. But Ray, thank you for indulging the question and I think it's really important. So I appreciate you putting it out in the world. Take thank care, Timmy. Thank you for bringing it up. See ya. <sighs> P. Diddy. You got thoughts on him? He's a... Uh, remarkably humble man you know um he's a businessman for sure T first and foremost 100 percent, right yeah so he's left-brained and he's right-brained yep and um very humble he, um he used to have he when he was growing up similar background to me in terms of he had a paper route i had a paper route yep and he worked himself up there i'm 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 a super admirer of i his. love it what uh while we're getting one more phone call sports just because it's a big interest of mine. What's your What's your life with sports, whether playing or consuming? Um, not much. Zero. Well, like, uh, uh, um, I, like I, uh, I, I, I. D don't get distracted. Oh, okay. You like ping pong? Uh, <laughs> I, what I do, I, I don't have much time for the, the sports. I respect that. Yeah. How about so growing I, up? Did you consume any sports growing up? Oh, I played golf. I I was on a high school football team. Yep. What you know, position? Uh, Safety. Uh, 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 I was a um, oh, strong. Well, I forgot what they call a strong line. I was strong on the side line. Back. Uh, I was uh -huh. on the line. Uh -huh. Very nice. Uh, Rushing the quarterback. Yeah. Trying to sack the quarterback. That was my job. You enjoyed it, uh, or you did it because it was the thing to do? Yeah, I I, I, I didn't really enjoy it very much. No, no. because I, what it was is like it was just sort of like following and hitting. 
you know, it wasn't one of those things in which I had any. They, they gave me plays. I understand. And the plays was you Could go you forward, hit that guy. No room it. for improv improvisation. Hello? Christy. Hello? Christy? No, is it Christy? It should be Christy. What's your it's, name, my friend? Christy and, yeah, Christy. It's Christy and Brian, Gary. How are you? We're doing well, Christy. How are you? I'm doing good. Let me put, let me put you on speakerphone. Christy's right here next to me. Hold on. No worries. You there, Gary? We are here, and we're with Ray. Awesome. Say hello. Hello. Say hello. Hello, Christy. Do you guys have a question? We do. We were just sitting here finishing dinner, and we're talking about it. We're like, oh, my gosh, I hope Gary calls us because we're huge fans. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, you, Christy. And our, our daughter's chiming in. She's two years old. She's saying yes as well. I love it. Mm, that's so, the best. I got two grandkids close to that. So mm. what, uh, <laughs> what, what question do we have? We are currently reading the book, Ray, and we, we just started reading it. It's a, a f fascinating book. You talked about it with Tony, Tony Robbins not too long ago. And we both want to know what your favorite principle has been so far. Well, my most important principle. Hold on real quick. Don't answer it. Your, his favorite from the people he's been asking or his personal favorite? His personal favorite. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, knowing how to deal with my not knowing. It's a. Uh, okay. Starts off, embrace reality yes. um, and, and deal with it. So to appreciate reality, knowing that I don't know, to separate myself from my own points of view and to take in the best and to learn and to evolve, all of those principles related to that, that's really where the greatest power it. comes from. I love it. Ryan Christie, thank you guys so much for calling. Thanks for reading the book. Thank you, Gary. We really appreciate it. We uh, we follow you everything you do. We, I would just listen to uh, to your speech in Oslo and the uh, hundred and eighty uh, the dollar eighty principle. We just started doing it with our small business, and we're already seeing feedback from it. So we go we're figure. Big fans. We're Thank you. you both. Thank you so much. Ooh, can I ask you the quick question of what the dollar eighty principle? So uh, I I am very I, I think the reason I'm really starting to gravitate towards you is one of the things that's fascinating about what I'm doing is I'm putting out so much content. I've been starting to talk about it as like open sourced entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Unlike a lot of individuals that are living my profile, I have very little ask for my audience. I'm not interested in monetizing my audience. I have a separate business world. It's not what I do, right? I understand completely. Good, so I figured you would. So. One of the things that's interesting is I live much more in prin in principles. You know, to me, I, I've in the way that you would use it. To me, things are very macro. There's there's rules about patience and the long game and and uh, you know uh, humility, self awareness, uh, lack of romance. I'm just not romantic about anything that happened yesterday. Things of that nature. Okay. Well, what that does is it gets very theoretical. And I'm concerned that my audience is getting the framework, but they are so hungry for the details, back to schooling and things of that nature. And I always say, leave that to others. But once in a while I get inspired. So I love leaving two cents. You know, What's your two cents on the issue, right? You're leaving your two cents. I came up with this concept on Instagram. When you put in a hashtag, it will show you nine posts at the top around that hashtag. So if we put in meditation right now on Instagram, there will be nine posts that are featured ahead of the others. Hmm. That's the UI of the product. Oh, I didn't know that. So I told people, if you have no audience and nobody knows who you are, you can produce content, but you can also become part of the community. And so what I did on Twitter in the early days, Ray, when nobody knew who I was when I was running a wine business, is I went on Twitter and I answered everybody's wine questions that they were tweeting about. I left my two cents at scale. So I said, look, there's nine Trend, there's nine posts per hashtag. Every day I want you to pick 20 hashtags that are relevant to your business or your ambitions, your nonprofit, whatever it may be, right? So nine times two cents for every post. Go to those posts, look at the post, consume the post, and add value to the conversation. Don't mm -hmm. leave a post that says, buy my book, check out my profile, follow me. No, be thoughtful of what you see and then contextualize it and leave a meaningful point of view in the comments section. If you do that for nine posts on a, on a, uh, uh, at a time per hashtag, you end up leaving $1.80 a day of your two cents times 90. Ooh, cool. And so what's been amazing is this has only been out for two or three days and I'm so glad it got brought up. I'm getting enormous feedback. These are people who have 100, 200 See, followers. See, that's very practical. It is very practical. Right. And, and that is very rare for me because I, I'm just not into that. It's not how I process. Uh, okay, but you, you see, you know those things. 
That's why I'm saying, like, if you could do the following, I'm just going to give you advice. Please, and I'm listening. I love it. it. I love it. I'm it. open it's to it, especially given it coming okay. from you based on do what it, I know about do you. It, do, it in your, do it in your own way. Because when you're actually at a nitty gritty level yes. and you say one of those and you then just dictate it, like you're great verbally. Yes. You can just knock these things off like this. You'll love this, right? Okay. I apologize. This is insane that this is happening. Iris, this is how you have to edit the day. Today, Iris came to me. She films me all day today. I'm at a conference, I'm making a joke that I like her the best more than D-Rock and Bab and the other people that film me. And I said, because of that, I'm gonna start articulating. And this is maybe in the subconscious. I didn't even know we were doing the Q&A show today. Theoretically, I knew it was coming this week, but it could have been tomorrow. I literally started explaining things. They came to me and they said, we're gonna put up your slide at the end of your talk. I said, could you put up the slide for the first two minutes when I go up there and then you can show me live on the, jump, on the three different screens and then you can end with my slide. That's just my normal demeanor. But what I did was I challenged myself, back to what you just asked me to do, and I looked in the camera and I explained to my audience in real time why I did that, and it's because the way Twitter works, if there was even one person in that audience that would see the slide go up, follow me on Twitter or get to know what my handle was, and they wanted to tweet my quotes while I was speaking, that wouldn't have been able to be done had the slides come at the end, and that's why I always ask for my slide to go up in the first two minutes with my social media handles so that the audience can become the amplification of awareness of what I have to say. And so I'm starting to get into a process in this point of my career where I am starting to challenge myself to get into these details, and I assume that makes a lot of sense well, to you because that's yeah, what you yeah. do. So uh, as you see in the book, and, and it's the same thing, what you have is the high level principle yes. and then you gotta get down to that formula. Like your dollar eighty formula yes. actually yes. gives that so Can I, mean, I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. I think I've struggled with that because I enjoy the unveil too much. Mm -hmm. I have felt in the last six months, and now it's synthesizing in this moment, right now, that there's been a little bit too much of me enjoying the aha of the detail, making the macro statement and having it be true two years later instead of over-articulating it. No, 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 I know, I get it. I'll tell you there's a different I aha. I mean, like, <clears throat> if you write down every principle and yes. so on, even the act of you thinking it and writing it yes. down and clearing yes. it and showing it yes. to it, lights up discovery. I get it. I, I enjoy discovery. that in the macro. It's why nobody, Ray, right, I don't know if you know, I, I assume you don't. Well, actually, through the process, you may. Nobody's producing the level of content and putting it down that I am. I believe in it so much that I've created a human production company okay. infrastructure. Do you have a book of principles? No, I don't. Do it. I understand. Ray, this has been super enjoyable. It's been a blast for me too. Ray, uh, every guest on this show gets to ask the question of the day. So right now, you're gonna look into that camera and on Facebook and YouTube, thousands and thousands of answers. Here's a chance for you to do a little focus group, make a statement, I could care less, ask them what their favorite color is. I doubt that that's what's gonna happen. What question would you like to ask the Vayner Nation? Can you separate yourself from your opinions so that you open yourself up to the entire possibility of different points of view to get the best ones for you? That's the biggest Question source of success. All. Love it. Ray, again, thank you. Gary, thank you for having Enjoyed me. Enjoyed it. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.